Great, well, it's exciting to be here. And I'm here to share um, some important needs and also opportunities in healthcare. So if we look at the numbers, the needs in healthcare are definitely large. Uh, in the United States, we spend more on healthcare and get worse outcomes than comparable countries. And if we look at different diseases, our success rates and our treatments vary from, say, 30 to 60% on a lot of average diseases. Right, so there's definitely work to be done here. Now, the good news is that there's lots of really cool clinical questions that data science can address. So some general work in the field. Um, there's great work in imaging, looking at trying to figure out um, where strokes are in, in patients, um, how to control seizures through neural stimulation, um, how to predict sepsis. So this is just examples of, uh, and all of this work is being done by female PIs. Uh, and then work in our lab, where we're trying to predict interventions in the ICU. We're taking data from electronic health records and online health forums to try to better understand diseases, such as autism spectrum disorder, which is very heterogeneous. And a big barrier in that region, regime is just even figuring out what a disease is, right? And if we can categorize it better, maybe we can do better treatments. And then uh, finally, another area that we're working in is optimizing the treatment of HIV. So lots of really, really cool applications that can have huge impact for patients, right? So these are real problems where we can have real impact. And uh, I'm gonna share today the technical part of just one of these problems, which is the optimization of treatment of patients with HIV. All right, so just to give you a little bit of background, uh, HIV affects about 36 million people worldwide. And the way it's treated is people are given cocktails of antiretroviral drugs. And the disease is rapidly mutating. So you use the one drug cocktail for some time, um, you become resistant, uh, or rather the virus becomes resistant, you have to switch to something else. So we have to think about a sequence of decisions here. Because if we get a choice of cocktails that will cause the patient to be resistant to all future cocktails, then we're in trouble, right? So we need to figure out how do we plan for now as well as the future. So how have data scientists uh, attacked this problem in the past? I'm going to share two general ideas. Again, this is just one vignette to give you a feel of uh, what sort of cool things we can do in the healthcare space. So there's a class of techniques called kernel-based approaches. And you can think of them as nearest neighbors. So if I want to predict what's going to be good for a particular patient, say the one with the red dot over here, I'll look at similar patients. And I'll look at what worked well for them. And so what has uh, been, uh, to date, a uh, popular or common approach is to, to do this and also to, to look just in the near term and say, all right, if I gave this drug, it dropped the patient's viral load um, below some level for a short period of time, and, and that, was, that, that we consider con success. But as I mentioned, um, we have to consider the long term as well, right? Now, there's another class of techniques that are called model-based techniques in reinforcement learning. So the idea here is that instead of looking for nearest neighbors, right, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually try to simulate what the disease process might look like. So what we're going to do is we're gonna say there's some hidden disease state that we don't know, right? Lots of complicated, people are very squishy and diseases are even squishier, so we have no idea what's going on. We just call that the, the white circle over there. Uh, we give drugs and that changes the system, the system that we can observe, but we can observe certain measurements like uh, the, the CD4 counts or the viral loads, et cetera. And if we have a model for the system, the patient, then we can figure out what the best treatments are. And this is appealing, but it's hard to do in practice because we have so many measurements um, and not enough data. How do we actually train these models? So the key insight that we had for this particular work is that these approaches have actually complementary strengths. So imagine that we have this, this picture and there's patients that are in clusters, right? So if my red patient that I'm trying to predict, uh, you know, which drug cocktail should I give this person, happens to have a lot of other similar patients, maybe the right thing to do is just look at, around at those similar patients. Those are the best examples that I have and say, let's try to copy what worked best for those patients, right? Seems very reasonable, right? If you're lucky to have a clone in your database, then there's nothing better, right? Because it models you exactly. 
On the other hand, you might have patients who don't have nearby neighbors. And this is where those nearest neighbor approaches fail, because it's not a good idea to just map to the nearest neighbor if the nearest neighbor is far away. And in such situations, it might actually be better to fall back on a more simplified notion of how disease progresses rather than something that's wrong, right? So the key insight here is that it's better to have a simple explanation rather than a wrong explanation, okay? Um, and then what, what do we do? We combine. So it, here's, the, here's the insight. And the, the way we are going to put it together is we're going to say, well, uh, our kernel is going to suggest an action. Our PUMDP, which if you don't know what it is, it doesn't matter. Um, think of it as the model-based approach, is going to select an action. And then we're going to choose between the two recommendations based on, again, where the patient lives in this patient space. Right? That's a key idea. So again, the kernel action. Um, in the past, people have used short-term uh, success criteria, like does the viral road load go down? or not, um, and we extend that to take into account, are we creating is additional mutations? Because we don't want to create mutations. Those are the things that will um, screw us over in the future. Um, and are we keeping the viral load down? Um, and then we build the POMDP. I'm not going to go into all the details um, that, and solve the policy, right? So jumping to the, to the, uh, you know, the conclusion of like, does this work? Well, we looked at a database of around 33,000 patients uh, holding out about 3,000 for testing. And again, we had information not only about traditional measurements like CD4 counts and viral loads, but we also had all the mutations of the virus over time for these patients, which is becoming increasingly common. This database comes from the EU, um, but recently there are efforts in South Africa as well to do more genotyping because we've found that it's very valuable to understand and uh, actionable in terms of choosing treatments for HIV. I also want to emphasize the large size of the action space here. So there's 20 drugs that were used in over 1,000 different combinations, and we limited ourselves to only 300, right? So if you're thinking about this from like hard problems in data science, the fact that we have so many different choices for actions with a relatively small data set, like, uh, and this is something else that I want to highlight. In, in healthcare, our data are inconveniently sized, which is what I often like to say, <laughs> because they're not small, right? 33,000 patients, it's not a small data set. But it is small by big data standards, right? We have to think a little bit carefully about how we're going to use the data. And then here are the results um, with, with slightly different scales and the rewards. And so if we apply just a random policy, you do pretty poorly. Um, the ST policy is the policy that you get if you just think about short-term rewards. So you think, you know, I just want to keep the viral load down tomorrow or in the next three weeks, and I don't think about the future. How well do I do in the long run? And then the LT, long-term nearest neighbor or kernel policy, you'll notice does significantly better in the long run. And it may be obvious to all of us in the room because we're used to thinking about machine learning and sequential decision-making process, but this was actually news to some of the clinicians that we worked with who were not sure that it made sense to even think about the future because they thought the future might be too uncertain. They're like, who knows what will happen to the patient? We were actually able to show, actually, there is enough predictability in this disease progression that you can think about the future and you can optimize for it. Now, what you'll notice is that the PUMDP policy, which is a model-based approach, that's the approach that I said is too simple, actually does quite a bit worse, right? Um, but if you combine the two in the mixture that I mentioned, um, we do quite a bit better than the long-term kernel policy. And the PUMDP is actually being chosen 30% of the time. So now, like a good data scientist, uh, we went through and we checked, okay, was our hypothesis correct? Is it the case? that we are choosing the kernel when we have nearby neighbors and we're using the model when the, there is no nearby neighbors, right? That was, again, our, our hypothesis for this domain. And we find out it is the case. So these graphs show that if you look at the distances, the distances to the nearest neighbors in the PUMDP are higher than if you are looking for your nearest neighbors and also correlated with history length. So if you have a long history, it's harder to look similar to someone, right? Because you just had a lot of things happen to you and what are the chances that somebody else also had all those exact same things happen to you, right? So this was super exciting. Um, this is recent work that, that's gonna be published at AMIA this year. And my, cl uh, my colleague uh, just spent two days uh, this past week going through with, the, with our collaborators on HIV 
and going through and checking, okay, does this policy actually make sense, right? Because we evaluated it using some retrospective data analysis techniques on the observational cohort. There could be all sorts of funny biases. Um, but again, two days of vetting by the clinicians, they actually look reasonable. So I'm super excited. So we've, we've taken uh, a, a data science problem, a clinical problem, we formalized it, we found a key insight that made it work, uh, and we got reasonable results, right? So that just giving you the story of like a full pipeline of the sort of things you can do in this space. And as this stuff becomes more and more vetted, of course, we're hoping that it will inform the treatment of actual patients. So now I want to zoom out, and I want to mention that um, there's a, so I mentioned all the clinical problems, right? Like working with seizures, working with HIV, working with disease subtypes. What are the data science problems that you could be solving in this space? So when it comes to healthcare, we have a lot of low quality biased data, right? It's a lot of observational data, and it captures really important populations. Because if we look at people who are actually just showing up to hospitals, that's the real people who are showing up to hospitals, right? We're not selecting out for, I only want to look at this race that shows up at the, ho uh, or I only want to look at this age group or this gender. We're actually seeing the real population. But that means, again, that uh, our data sources are often of very low quality. Um, we can mark some of those, so semi-supervised methods are very important. Um, people only come in when they feel like it, so we really need models for uh, data that only shows up by convenience. Um, Off-policy evaluation, as I said, and more important than anything else, I think, is interpretability, because we have to be able to convince the clinicians that we haven't screwed up somehow and we're doing something that's reasonable. Now, these are really, really cool problems, and what I want to finish up with is just to zoom back a little bit, because this is also a you know, Women in Data Science conference, tell you a little bit about my path to getting here, because I am so excited about the work that I'm doing, but it definitely was not a straight shot to get here. So I grew up um, with my great uncle, uh, was part of India's independence movement. I went to a high school that gave not only uh, focus on government and national studies, even though it had a really fantastic math program, the focus was on government. And yet I found that as much as I was kind of interested in activism, my interests were more towards academics. You know, it's kind of embarrassing. I like statistics and science. Um, I couldn't really imagine myself working in a soup kitchen, which in that mind, uh, and at that time was my mind of like what service was all about. Um, and it took me like five academic degrees, hopefully it doesn't take you guys that long, um, <laughs> to figure out how am I going to deliver those warm fuzzies that I really cared about with cold hard numbers. Um, and I'm very happy that today I found a way to combine things that I'm passionate about with the sort of skills that I have and the things that I like doing day to day. And we are all incredibly privileged because you all love data and data is everywhere. So the last thing that I want to end with is that you know, no matter what cause you care about, there's a lot of really important problems out there. And whatever cause you care about, there's data associated with those. And I really encourage you to pursue your passions and solve those real problems. And if the, that uh, area happens to be in health, or you, you think it might be in health, one place that I encourage you to check out is the Machine Learning for Healthcare Conference. If you go to muckmed.org, um, the next conference is happening in Boston next summer, but also on our website is a list of past speakers, people in the field that you can talk to. There's a lot of really important areas in this space, um, and I hope you'll be part of the solution to solving them. Thank you. Thank you. That is a great conference. Um, so we have uh, five minutes for some questions. We have a mic. Um, there's a question here as well for, for later. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask a question about uh, slide 10? You talked about the nearest neighbor. It's maybe a little. I think okay. there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you said that you're looking at the uh, nearest neighbors and you're looking at the neighborhood. So how you define this threshold or neighborhood that look at or don't look at? So I see, yep, so good question. So it goes into the, the classifier here uh, under patient statistics. So we look at the quantile distances. So what is the distance between this patient 
Um, and the, the nearest patient is not necessarily the most informative, though we put that into the regression as well. But you can also look at the, 20, uh, the, the first quantile. So if you look at 25% of the patients who are uh, near, near to this person, what, what distance is that? So that gives you a sense of clustering or clumping together. So you explored many techniques to map uh, the best treatments for certain patients for pretty well-researched diseases and conditions like HIV. But is there a way to possibly map these uh, conclusions to more rare conditions, perhaps uh, such as neurologic endocrinology um, or things like that, that may be able to be utilized with machine learning or predictive modeling? I think there's a lot of opportunities in this space. Uh, there, I think when, as soon as you have diseases that are more rare, I think it becomes important to bring in more and more domain knowledge. So I think the technical question becomes, how do we take information that clinicians know? Because they know a lot. And I think there's often this like machine learning, data science hubris of like, let's just look at the data. But the more we can incorporate domain knowledge and say what's going to be plausible, we can use it to filter out hypotheses. But yes, I think there's in, important technical questions, and I think that problem can be addressed. So, so next year, when you're done with high school, can you please apply to Stanford? <laughs> <laughs> next question. Hi, uh, I think the clinical work is fantastic, um, but if you think of healthcare more broadly, uh, we have, people have called our um, infant mortality rates an embarrassment. Uh, we pay far more than any other country, and we haven't even insured everyone. Um, we have more uninsured people than are in most in many European countries. So do you see any opportunities to make headway in sort of the healthcare space more broadly? So that, that's a great question. Um, so my personal take on this is that I think that for people who want to do the analytics, if, if that's where your heart is in terms of your passion and your skill, I think some of this more point of care bedside stuff is more accessible or amenable because you can find clinicians who will adopt your techniques and try them and, and get those policies to change on a small scale. I think changing policy on a high level, it, I mean, data will definitely be needed to support it. But honestly, I think the evidence is already there. We can look at these other countries and we can see that certain social structures and certain healthcare structures result in better quality. And it's not necessarily, I don't think the question is, you know, does the data support that we need change? I think that we need to, uh, you know, we need to advocate to our government for change. But it's, it's not a really a question of like, is, is there, a, does it need to be done? It, it does need to be done, yeah. Right, well, this is a great point to, uh, to change over to the next speaker uh, in a bit. Okay. So thank you. thank you so much again, Zinale, for coming. Yeah.